Jesus. Is ever, you know what is great to come into the house of the Lord and just hear the excitement going around. That shows that people are excited and they're, they're just glad they're here. You know, as I have over the years, I have witnessed some people come into church and they come in like this and they're sad. We should be happier when we come here than any other place. Because the Lord tells us, forsake not the gathering ourselves together. And we come together to worship together in a corporate group to worship our Lord and Savior and our Heavenly Father and to worship Him and glorify Him. So we should be the happiest people in the world when we're in the church. We should be the happiest people in the world wherever we are because we have our salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to, I don't ever want to join in with these up here because they are up here just singing their hearts out of the Lord and that's what we need to be doing as well. Father, we come to you, Lord, to praise you, to glorify you, to worship you, and put you above all things and show you this morning how much we love you and care for you, Father. Lord, as we come this morning, Lord, we just ask your Holy Spirit to come in. Fill this place, Lord, with your Spirit, Father. And that when we leave from here today, Lord, we'll be saying that we have been great to be in the house of the Lord. And, Father, we know, Lord, that you have things that you desire to do for, for us and through us this day, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you help us open our hearts that we receive from you what you would have for us, Lord, that we may go forth and do the work that you have called us to do. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor of what you're going to do here today and in our lives, throughout our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all stand up and let's worship together.
Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and you're burdened with heavy burdens. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, he said, for in me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. In me, you will find rest for your souls. It's our custom here at Harvest, and it's a good custom to receive communion here on the first Sunday of the month. I ask you to be seated right now in His presence. As we approach this time, and as the brethren are getting ready to come forward to give the elements to you, let's take a few moments and let the Lord talk with us and let's listen to Him. He said, my sheep hear my voice. They'll follow me. Sometimes we need a cleansing. We need healing. That's in, that's in the cross. That's in his cross. You can go ahead, brethren, and serve the elements as we just be in prayerful attitude or reverent attitude as the elements come to you today. This morning I was out in the, uh, sometimes on a Friday night or a Saturday night, you can go out in the ditch in front of my house on Highway 29, and there's usually some trash out there, some cans or some bottles, and it's usually going to be there. <laughs> and I just was looking for a bag in the ditch as I walked along, and I said, uh, you know, there's some trash out here. Maybe there's a bag, and so there was one there the Lord provided for me. I don't think it was a Walmart or Dollar General bag, but it was a, it was a plastic bag. There are some of those there, too. But I thought, Lord, you know, my life is sometimes like this. <laughs> I need you to come along and just pick up the junk out of it. It looks a little trashy, looks a little worn. I don't know if you're that way sometimes, but sometimes there are blemishes and there's a need for cleansing in our lives. And so let's pray right now. Jesus said, come unto me, and maybe you're coming today for wholeness and restoration. Maybe there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus Christ, and I invite you even in this prayer to come to Him. You may be here with a need for forgiveness, or you may need to forgive someone for something they've done wrong to you. You may be holding that. It's possible. But the Lord wants us to come to His cross today, and He wants us to have forgiveness. We confess our sins. He's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much is that? That's, that's all, is it? And so we come to him today. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the provision that's made in Christ Jesus, that we might commune with you, that we might have fellowship with you today. Some of us are bowing our heads right now, and we're in need of forgiveness. We're in need of a washing, of a cleansing. We're in need of a correction. We thank you for that being provided in Christ Jesus and his finished work on the cross for us. You said in your word that we should examine ourselves, and then we should drink of the bread, drink of the cup and eat the bread, remembering you. And so we do that right now, Lord. Forgive us. Cleanse us today. There are some who need to be healed today in their bodies. Right now, if that's you, would you just touch yourself if you can? Father, we thank you for the healing that's provided in your atonement for our souls, for our spirits, for our minds, for our bodies. Some of us need restoration for sure, but some of us here, here just need some rest. 
in you. And our rest is in you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song will rise to you. Holy, 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 all the saints adore you who were and are, evermore shall be. We bless you today. The scripture says this, with your cup in your hand, and we invite you, all of you who know Lord as Savior, to do this today together. The scripture says, For I see from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take that bread? And let's take it together. Savior for being broken so that we could be whole, for giving yourself so that we would not have to be broken in our relationships or in our lives, in any part of our lives. Bring your healing and your health now to this body. I pray in the name of Jesus as we sit here in this house today, in your name. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember him as we take this cup together. Amen. Your grace so free washes over me. Would you lead us in that part of that song? Your grace so free washes over me. We bless you, Lord. We bless you today.
God, we're grateful today for the knowledge that one day Jesus came. He died for us, shed his blood, gave his body on the cross so that we could experience grace, so that death could be arrested in our life, so that spiritual death could be conquered and we could be assured of life evermore as we come into relationship with your son. Body of Jesus, there is healing. And God, we pray in this moment that you heal your children, strengthen bodies, remove diseases, restore bones and fibers and sinews back to the original purpose that you created them for, Father. And in the shed blood of Jesus, forgiveness came. Thank you today, Lord, that we can come into this house and know as we are in relationship with Jesus, that our sins are forgiven. Our name is written in the book. Holy Spirit, seal that knowledge in us today so that no plan of the enemy could rob it from us. We give you thanks and praise in the glorious name of Jesus. And all God's children said, amen, amen. Do you love him today? Are you glad to be in his house? Are you thankful for the body and the blood of Jesus? Well, let's give him a good hand clap of praise in his house this morning. There's lots of ways we praise him. We praise him in singing. We praise him with our voices. We praise him with our hands, our instruments that he's provided us all with. And we give him thanks today. And it's so good to be in his house. And we welcome you to Harvest Christian Center. We trust the Holy Spirit has already welcomed you. And you feel welcomed by his presence in this place. We're very glad to have you. My wife and I extend our greetings to you and uh, are so thankful that you're here today. We have some special guests with us today. Tammy's mom and two sisters are all in the service. This is a rare, rare occasion. <laughs> Tammy's mom and one sister is here and the other sister's in the back, so they got this section kind of bookend right here. They got that one kind of taken care of, but we're glad to have them in the service with us, especially Liz, coming all the way from New Jersey. Now, when you hear about a good church, you'll just travel as far as you need to to <laughs> come to a good church. Amen. So we're thankful to have them here in the house with us. And we want to welcome any of our first-time guests with us. If you're a first-time guest at Harvest, we just ask you to do one thing for us this morning, and that's just to slip up your hand really quickly and uh, let us know that you're here. We have a first-time guest right up here on the front, right up here and right back here. Let's make our guests welcome Harvest, would you? If inside that uh, gift that we have for you is a connection card, if you will just take that and fill it out at, during the service and uh, give that to us at the end of the service, we have an information table and a welcome table at the back. We have a special gift for you. We have a group of folks who are we call our welcome bakers, and they cook home-baked goods every Sunday to give to our first-time guests. So please stop by, turn in your card, and make sure you pick that up. But we welcome you. Harvest, let's welcome them one more time into the house of the Lord here with us today. And we invite you to come back and be with us as often as you can. Uh, we do have a few key announcements that I want to share with you. First of all is that Pastor John is not here. And, uh, it, but it's a good thing that he's gone to do. His daughter, Janae, is graduating this weekend. I think she graduated yesterday. And so we congratulate them. He's down to three left in the house now out of seven. <laughs> Uh, Jada will be leaving in November for the Navy, so he's down to his last three, and, and uh, we congratulate John A. and are thankful for that, but we miss Pastor John and, and Sister B. when they are not here. The other announcements are tonight. It's first Sunday, so it's first Sunday prayer that we have here at Harvest Christian Center tonight at 6 o'clock for one hour from 6 to 7. We ask that we come together as a church family and pray and believe God for every need that is within this church. We have our prayer list that we go over and then other prayer needs that we share and then the Holy Spirit just begins to guide us as we gather together toward the end of our prayer time up front and, and we join hands in unity together to pray over the needs of the church and, and what God would have us to do. So we invite you to come out. It's a powerful time and it's getting more powerful each time we gather together. So if you can come out, uh, make the extra effort to come out and be a part of that. And then this week is Big ministry week for us. The second week of the month is always a big full ministry time for us. We have food bank 
uh, trailer being unloaded is that right on Tuesday at 10 a.m. so if you'd like to help us unload sort and on this Tuesday we also box up the food I know Miss Melanie and Miss Linda and the others that uh, lead that charge in boxing up the food would welcome any help that we could get and then on Thursday if you can be here at 845 to help us distribute the food on the second Thursday of each month so 845 on Thursday 10 o'clock on Tuesday that'd be a great help to us and then nursing home is also this week this Thursday Meet in the lobby of specialty care at Pine Forest Road at 1.55 p.m. And at 2 o'clock, you'll be involved in the ministry to the elderly there at specialty care. Pastor Fred, you can see Pastor Fred for more information. And this week is also Golden Harvesters Week. So the Golden Harvesters, age 50 and older, or if you feel like you're 50 and want to join us, you can. Uh, it's this Friday at 11 a.m. in the chapel, and it's a... It's kind of a potluck, so bring enough for you and a few others, uh, desserts, food, everything. We always have such a huge spread and have great fellowship, so come out and be with us this Thursday at 11 a.m. Amen. And also, right before we uh, receive our tithe and offering this morning, I do want to welcome new members that joined our church last week. Uh, one of them I don't see this morning, Kevin Owen. Most of you would know Kevin. Uh, usually sits right up here on the front row. Uh, we'll uh, recognize him again, but we do have Jerome and Tara McQueen and their family, Kai, Jordan, Chase, and Peyton. Wave at us, folks, right there. They joined the church last Sunday. We're so glad to have you as a part, officially, of Harvest Christian Center. So if you would like to join the church, maybe you're a part of Harvest already, uh, we'll have another membership Sunday coming up. We'll let you know about it, and you can meet with Pastor John, and he can go over all the things in the church and the questions that you might have about being a part of Harvest. But we, and, and Jerome's been up here the last two Wednesday nights on the drums, so he's already getting plugged in, and we thank God for that. We have the privilege now of worshiping the Lord in our giving. And this is a time not that we pause in the service, we take a break in the service. This is a time we worship in the service. Because one of the ways you can surely tell that you love God is by the operation of your pocketbook your wallet, your giving. It says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so today as we, there's Kevin. I didn't see you. Where were you? Were you sitting right there the whole time? You just slipped in on me, I know. <laughs> Wave at everybody, Kevin. There's no way I'd have missed that ugly face. Come on now. But as we worship the Lord today, we do, do so by giving. We sow his tithe. That doesn't even belong to us. That's his. And then we give our offerings above and beyond that. And we do that, and we give it to him. But the, he, in turn, plugs it in to this place called Harvest so we can accomplish and do the things that he has set upon this house to do. And by the way, during the month of August, in some of my messages, not today, but in some of the ones going forward in the month of August, we're going to be sharing the big parts the big practical parts of the vision that God has placed in our hearts for Harvest Christian Center and what he would like us to do and to accomplish. And while God doesn't need your giving, he uses your giving to accomplish his purpose through this church. And we thank you today and give you a great big thank you for your faithfulness to God as you worship him this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity and privilege to give to you today. As we worship you with our giving, Lord, let it be pleasing to you as we sow your tithe back to you so that your blessings can be released on our life. And we sow our offerings above and beyond so that we can experience those open windows of heaven and those blessings that we cannot contain. God, we do so because we love you and because we worship you. And then, Lord, we ask that you would take them and as you invest them into your kingdom, we would do the work that you have called us to do to see your kingdom expanded, to see souls saved, people healed, delivered, and set free, disciples made through the works and ministries of Harvest Christian Center, through the faithful giving of your people. Set in motion now your promises, God, as your people give in worship to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as the offering passes you by, and let's continue to praise and worship our Lord this morning. I'm going free 
Today, as you're seated, turn around and tell somebody, hey, I'm free. Praise God. Praise God. I did this briefly last Sunday, but I want to take another opportunity to thank all of our pastoral team uh, that preached during the month of July. Uh, Pastor Fred, Pastor Jerry, Pastor John, Pastor Al for bringing such powerful words. Do you appreciate the great uh, words that they brought to you over the month of July? Amen. The last week of that, Tammy and I were in Orlando, Florida. That always sounds like vacation when you say Orlando. Uh, prior to that, we spent two and a half days with our kids in, in uh, Fort Myers. Now, that was a vacation. That was uh, a wonderful time. The week we spent in Orlando was a wonderful time, but it wasn't vacation because we stayed busy the whole time, didn't we? Pastor Fred and uh, Miss Carolyn were there with us, and, and uh, it was a busy time, but it was an incredible time, and we heard some very powerful messages. I'm not going to share those messages with you today. I thought about doing that. I thought about just giving a recap of some of the things we heard there, and I may do that at some point, but we heard from Beth Moore, who came and brought the most powerful Pentecostal message I've ever heard a Southern Baptist girl preach, uh, actually. Uh, she just brought an incredibly powerful word challenging us 
about the Holy Ghost and fire. It was incredible, and I will share parts of that uh, together with what we heard from uh, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, who, who came and brought another powerful word. And their, their styles are complete opposite from each other. Uh, most, uh, many of you are f- very familiar with Beth Moore and her Bible studies and her teaching, and some of you may follow her on, on television when she teaches and does some of the things she does there. But she's very deliberate, very powerful, but very deliberate, very to the point. And Samuel Rodriguez warned us up front. He said, first of all, I'm Hispanic, and second of all, I talk fast. So when you add those two things together, man, you just about go into the future when you're listening to him. (laughs) He speaks so fast. But he brought a powerful word as well about it's time to pick up your mat and walk. And, uh, and, and we will share some of those probably together at some point in a message because they were so powerful, and I believe they weren't just for the people that were there in that conference. I believe it was a message to our church and to the church in general. And, and so we look forward to doing that and had a, had a great time while we were there, but it was good to be back home. And then when we got home on Tuesday, Tammy and I celebrated our 36th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Hallelujah. The fact that she has survived 36 years with me is an absolute miracle, although God is still in the miracle working business, I can tell you. But, uh, honey, I'm looking forward to 36 more. We'll only be 93 then, so we can handle that. That would be awesome. We got married when we were very young, by the way. (laughs) Hallelujah. Today I want to share with you a message that, uh, giving it a title today, I give it a title of Who Are We? Who are we? Or stated another way, maybe, how can we be sure who we are? How can we know who we are? And our beginning text today is from Matthew chapter number 16, verses 24 through 27. It says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it, I'm sorry, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to to his works. Let's pray over the reading of God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for your precious, powerful, alive word. Holy Spirit, we ask today that you would use your servant as a vessel to deliver this word into our hearts and to our lives, challenge us and affect change in us that will cause us to be molded and shaped into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. On Wednesday night, and and I don't know if you can help me or not, and I don't know if you guys can hear it, but I can hear a boom at the end of my sentences up here. So if there's a way that we can pull that out, it may just be in the monitors. But uh, on Wednesday night, we introduced a new Wednesday night series called Not a Fan, and it's based on a book and a movie by Kyle Eidelman and the church that he's the pastor of. It's a very powerful um, book and a powerful movie, and it's based on the heart provoking question that asks this, am I a fan or am I a follower? Now, I'm not going to preach about being a fan or a follower, and I'm not certainly not going to reteach the whole lesson from Wednesday night. Uh, it was the introductory uh, session for our series. We do invite you to come. In fact, I encourage you to come out and join us as we take a few weeks to explore where we are and who we are in our walk with Jesus Christ and in our relationship with him. But in that first introductory session, we took a look at, uh, primarily we took a look at what the difference is between a fan and a follower. And I do want to share just a couple of things really quickly about that before I get into the heart of the message about who are we. And so we talked many things. There were many things shared about what the difference is between a fan and a follower. In fact, I introduced the whole session on being a fan or a follower talking about what a an, what an, uh, rabid fan of Auburn football I am. And I've shared that with you many times, and it usually brings a cascade of booze from about 60%, <laughs> maybe a little bit more than that, maybe 70% of the group. But And some of you are rabid fans of whatever team, whatever team you choose to uh, be a fan of. And 
And being a fan really costs us very little. We can all be fans. In fact, there's a lot of fans that are fair weather friends, fans. As long as your team is doing well, you're a big time fan and you're all about talking about them. The second they start doing poorly, you shut up. If I did that, I would be quiet half of my life having been an Auburn fan. But I never gave up. I never turned my back. I was still a fan, but it didn't cost me anything to be a fan. And so a couple of the things that we looked at as the difference between a fan or a follower of Jesus Christ is a fan cheers, but a follower pursues. A fan will cheer everything, but a follower is going to pursue what they're uh, after. A fan knows what someone does, but the follower knows who someone is. So you can be a fan of somebody and know what they do, but you're a follower when you know who they are. A fan requires little to nothing, and a follower requires commitment and sacrifice. A fan, last one is this, costs nothing. It costs nothing. You can be a fan and it costs you nothing, but a follower has a price to pay and is willing to pay it. So with that as a, as a framework or a foundation to begin today as we determine who are we, in our passage from Matthew 16, Jesus himself gives us his perspective of a follower. He says this in verse 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there's three things in there that Jesus speaks to. He doesn't say, do all that and become a fan of me. Because I would venture to say in a lot of our churches around the world today, especially in Western culture, we have a lot of fans in the church, fans of Jesus. People that know who he is are grateful for him whenever he's doing things that are helping them, whenever Jesus is winning for us. We're a big fan, but as soon as we get that experience of not winning or a little suffering or a little sacrifice, uh, we don't quite stay in that place of being a follower. And so let's take a look at the three things that Jesus says here. And I, I know I haven't preached since July the 2nd. And so some of you may have been anticipating pastor's going to come back and he's going to be ready with one of them feel good sermons. And he's, just, we're going to go out of here. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to go out of here today challenged by the word of God. You are going to go out of here challenged by the word of God today. Because as I was anticipating and and getting ready for this Sunday, I really was going to do the Beth Moore, Samuel Rodriguez, Ed Stetzer recap because it would be very powerful for you. In fact, on Wednesday night, I shared some of the things that Ed Stetzer shared with us at our conference. But Tammy was having a procedure this week, a test this week. And while I was waiting for that test to be done, I had my Bible with me. It's the only thing I took in. Oftentimes, I don't take anything in or I'll take a book in to read, but this time I just took my little Bible. I have a really small uh, New King James Version that will just about fit in the palm of your hand. And so I took it in, and I was just sitting there reading, and I started reading over in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And how many of you know you can read all three of those books in, in a 15-minute time span because they're not very long? But Pastor Fred, as I was reading, I kept coming to this Scripture, kept coming to this place and God began to challenge me based on some of the things I had heard while I was away. But he began to challenge me in my own spirit about who are you, Rick Fountain? Who are you? And I knew we were getting ready for this series called, Are You a Fan or a Follower or Not a Fan? And, and I, I, God began to deal with me about that. I know sometimes you think that pastors get up here and preach messages that they want to get to you. But... 99% of the time, the Lord preaches the message to us first and deals with us over it before he has us share it with you. And so that's the case today because uh, I really wrestled with it and I kept going away from it. And I kept coming back to it and I kept going away from it and God just wouldn't let me stay away from it. He's, he, he placed me in this scripture and other scriptures in those three books, but most of them I'll share from one place in just a moment. But here's, in, the, in this verse in Matthew 16, he says this, deny yourself. That's the first thing he says. If you're going to, if you're going to come after me, if you're really going to be my disciple, how many of you know what disciple means? It means follower of Christ. How many of you know what Christian means? It means to be Christ-like. He says, if you're really going to be a Christian, if you're really going to be a disciple, you have to deny yourself. 
Now, I got to tell you, in our Western culture, and, and I, I don't pick on Western culture, it's just my point of reference. In our Western culture, we, we have made a walk with Jesus, a life in Jesus, something that we just receive Christ as our Savior, and instead of getting a new life, we just want him to bless our old life as a saved person. We don't really look for or pursue change that happens after we receive Jesus. And Jesus says, oh no, if you're really my disciple, if you're really a follower and not a fan, if you're really a follower and not just a believer in me, then you're going to deny yourself. What does that mean to deny ourselves? Instead of being in relationship with Jesus to see what we can get out of it, he calls us to see what we can give into his kingdom, what we can do. Sounds like a familiar speech that was given about America. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And Jesus, at a greater level than that, is saying you've got to deny yourself. And it's more than just self-denial. It's to allow Jesus to direct our lives instead of us directing them. Allowing and saying, God, not my will, but your will be done in every area of our life. But we've made it so comfortable to be a Christian, so easy to be a Christian, that I think that we are falling way short of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, back to the fan follower thing for just a moment. It's okay to be a fan. Being a fan is a good thing. But if you stop there, you are missing what God, what Jesus himself is saying for us to do and for us to be. And I believe that on purpose, God is challenging us as a fellowship here at Harvest to examine who we are. Where are we in our relationship with Christ? Am I a fan or a follower? Can I tell you, it's not a comfortable journey to take. And that's why we invite you to come out on Wednesday nights. Even if you don't normally come, come out on Wednesday night. Take this journey. Get an inventory of where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ and where he desires you to be. But he says, deny yourself. That means we got to surrender to him our time, our talent, and our treasure. And say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Here's the reality of most, of, most followers of Christ, not all, but many. Let me just say many. I don't want to be unfair. Many followers of Christ is, is, Lord, bless what I'm doing in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless what I'm doing in the name of Jesus. When Jesus wants us to say, Lord, what is it we want you to do? Then I know it will be blessed. He says, if you'll do what I call you to do, the blessings will come. Even in the midst of adversity, blessings will come. But don't just, don't just get saved, receive Jesus, become a fan and say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for saving me. Now I'm asking you to just bless everything I do in Jesus' name. Bless my day. No, Lord, bless your day that you have given me. And show me how to serve you. Denying myself, Lord, I don't want it to be about me because if it's left up to me, I'm going to mess things up. How many of you have ever messed things up for yourself? You don't have to raise your hand on this one, but how many of you still just wanted to blame somebody else for that mess up? Yeah, we do. And left up to our own devices, we will mess things up. It's a guarantee. But if we will pursue his will and we will ask him to reveal to us what he would have us do, how he would have us serve him that day, who he would have us speak to that day, how he would have us share our faith that day, either by words or by the way we live or the, by the way we react to things, deny yourself. That's the first thing Jesus says. If you want to be a true follower of me, you've got to deny yourself. How many of you know that is a difficult thing to do? Because we love self. I mean, we just do. We love things that make us feel good. We love things that make us happy. We love things that all of those things. And listen, I'm not saying God doesn't give us some of those things when we surrender our will to his. In fact, he will give us those things and more, and they will be better. But some of us may not have ever experienced that in our life because of the way we were taught and the way we were shown and the way our culture is presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ today in a lot of different areas is that once you get saved, man, you're home free. You just got your get out of hell card. And now you can go on and live your life because you're sure that you're not going to hell. And Jesus says, that's not a follower. If you're going to be my disciple, you're going to deny. Your, there's going to be some things you will do. Now listen, we don't have to do those things to come into relationship with him. We do those things because we've come into relationship with him. 
See, that grace so free, it is free. There is nothing we can do to earn grace, and it is free, but it's not cheap. It's free, but the grace that we experience was not cheap and is not cheap. And we have, to a large degree in our culture, cheapened the grace of God by saying, just get saved, get out of your, get your get out of hell free card, and then go on and live your life and, and ask the Lord to bless your life. And that's not what Jesus says at all. He says, deny yourself. You think that's tough? The next part, he says, pick up your cross. What does that mean? Does that mean I have to literally go get me a cross and carry it around with me? No, that's not what it means at all. But what the cross represents and was a symbol of was suffering and shame and obedience and death. I know some of you are thinking right now, well, I'm so glad I came back to hear pastor preach after being gone for four weeks. It's not the physical death that it represents. It's the death to our own spiritual nature, our own sinful nature, our own nature that we need to conquer through, that Christ conquered for us and that we need to receive so we can pick up our cross and follow him. The cross was not something exciting in that day. It was a, a symbol of, of suffering, a symbol of shame. And pastor, are you telling me, you've brought me here today to just build me up by telling me I'm going to suffer for Jesus. I'm going to tell, uh, this is what I brought you here to tell you today, is that when you suffer for Jesus, you are showing your relationship with him as a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the questions that we asked on Wednesday night, we asked a series of introspective questions, and one of them is, one of them was, have you suffered anything for Christ? What have you lost because of your relationship with Jesus Christ? And I'm here to tell you today, if you've lost nothing in your relationship with Jesus, if you've lost nothing because you were named as one of his, then we need to examine our lives and see where we are and see are we denying ourselves, see are we picking up our cross. We're in an age, folks, where simple, fun, happy Christianity is not going to sustain you or his church. I want to say that again. We're, we're in an age where simple, happy, fun Christianity is not going to sustain you or his church. God is looking for followers of Jesus. Now, while following him and denying ourselves and picking up our cross is not likely to cost any of us a physical death, I bet you there's some folks over in Sri Lanka and some other places in the world that it costs them their physical life to follow Jesus. And yet we don't want to stand up because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody and they're not going to like us anymore. I want you to know today God is calling his people to be followers, calling people to deny themselves. Why? Because if what we were doing now was working, the whole, the whole country would be saved. Clearly, it's not working. The world is overtaking the church rather than the church overtaking the world. The world is influencing the church at a greater level than the church is influencing the world. Now, rest assured, the church is not dying. I shared that on Wednesday night. The church in America is alive. It has continued to stay about the same for the last 25 years. So it's not dying, but it's not growing. All the news is not bad, but all the news is not good either. And the reason is, is because we've come to a place where we don't even like this scripture in Matthew anymore about denying ourselves and about picking up our cross and about following him. In fact, confession is good for the soul. I can't remember the last time I preached out of that passage of scripture. Because just like your faces are right now, that's the way most people react to the preaching of this scripture. It's not the most fun. If you were going to pick out your top 50 fun scriptures out of the Bible, this would not be in your top 50. But this is Jesus talking and describing what his followers will be like, what his disciples should be like. Denying ourselves. What does that mean? Giving up some time, giving up more time, giving up more talent, giving up more treasure. If you've got a talent and you're not using it for Jesus, shame on you. Shame on you. 
He didn't give it to you just so you could use it for your own personal pleasure and maybe for the world's entertainment. He gave it to you because he has a role for you in his kingdom. So how about denying ourselves and letting God use that for the purposes of his kingdom? If you're not picking up your cross and willing to suffer shame and willing to take the stand, Jesus carried that cross of shame and suffering. He didn't turn it down. He could have easily turned it down. He could have easily gotten himself out of it because he was still 100% God, but he did not because there was a cause that was greater, and it was his cause, his Father's cause. And he calls us to take up our cross. And while it may not cause us our physical death, it may cause the death of our desires and our ways and maybe even some relationships and our status in the world in which we live. Not saying it will. I'm just saying that in our life we've got to be willing to do that because being a follower of Jesus, while his grace is free, it was not cheap. And there is something that flows out of a follower relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is obedience. It is doing the things that he has called us to do. What has following Jesus cost you? We had some incredible answers to that. There were some people that following Jesus had already caused them, cost them their place in their family, cost them family members, cost them some friendships. But the question is, what has following Jesus cost you? Oh, you don't have to do things for it to cost you. You just got to be obedient and follow him. Just obedient and follow him. And then the third thing he says is follow me. That doesn't just mean to go where Jesus goes. It means to live as Jesus lived. That's how he wants us to follow him, to be imitators of him. Paul even emphasized that to us as a person just like us. Now, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, and he lived without sin. But Paul was kind of like us. And Paul said... Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me. Man, I'm going to tell you something. That's a lot of pressure to put on yourself, isn't it? That's a lofty goal to tell people, I want you to follow Christ just like I follow him. And if most people that call themselves Christians said that, we would be in our hurt locker if we followed them. Let's just be real. Y'all are waiting for 11 o'clock, aren't you? But I want you to understand something. This is an important message for the hour in which we live. We have softened our messages in the church such that we've made Christianity such an easy way to live. That Jesus is just going to meet all of your needs and everything is going to be rosy. And even when you're in trouble, he's going to bail you out every single time. And we never talk about what our responsibility is to him. We always talk about it like he's responsible to do that for us. And as followers of Jesus, he has called us to a different place. He says, follow me. Live with humility and compassion. Live with love and grace and mercy and all the other godly virtues that we find in Scripture. That's what he means when he says, follow me. Live like I lived. Love the people around you like I love the people. Well, how much did he love the people around Loved him enough to go to the cross for him. Sometimes we don't love them enough to stop and ask them how they're doing. I was reading Facebook, that wonderful place where you can be a fan of everything, where you can like everything. You can be a fan of people and stuff and puppy videos and all kind of things on Facebook. But I was on there and I was reading and I came across story that one of my preacher friends uh, put on there and he was talking about how he was had gone to a store and he, in, in the parking lot he saw someone crying and I've shared this story about how God used Tammy to minister to a young lady like this but he said I, I saw her and I just wanted to go on into Walmart and do my thing and come back out and go home but the Lord would not release me he, he convicted me about that and so I went over and just asked her how she was doing and she cried even harder and began to tell the story of what she was going through. And I just took a moment and began to pray and plead the blood of Jesus Christ over her life. And, and he said, and the Holy Spirit gave me boldness in which to do that. See, when, when you're a follower of Jesus, it's going to be inconvenient for you. There's no such thing as convenient Christianity. 
We've invented it. And we think we have it. But God didn't call us to be followers of Him, be disciples of Him, because it's going to be convenient. There are going to be times when the Lord interrupts our day if we're a true follower of Him in order to minister to somebody that's not in church on Sunday, not in Bible study on Wednesday night, not in a small group, but somebody that needs to hear that Jesus loves them and that He has a plan for their life and He is willing to help them if they will come into relationship with Him. Humility, compassion, love, mercy, grace. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's what Jesus is calling us to. I'm going to switch to this mic because I think my batteries are going out here. And I got to tell you something. As a, as a pastor and a preacher, I love preaching the fun messages. I love it. And that's why I kept trying to get away from 1 John, which is where I'm going to take you now in just a moment. God's view is a little different than what we have seen. You might say, Pastor, it's hard. Isn't his grace free? We don't have to work for it, do we? No, we absolutely do not. I've shared that with you already. But we do have to pick up our cross and follow him once we receive his grace. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't do it in order to gain salvation. Do it because you have gained salvation. You don't have to do all these things to come into relationship with me. You do these things because you have come into relationship with me. That what I've provided for you now causes you to desire to be a follower of mine. Our Western culture has made it too simple to be a follower of Jesus. Not to be a believer, but to be a follower. To be a disciple, a true disciple. God's view is a little different in His Word. And there is much in our salvation experience and our relationship that should be produced in our lives, but I just want to share two of them with you from 1 John this morning. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. If you're not, say oh no. I got one oh no. There's always a smart aleck in every crowd. Hallelujah. In 1 John chapter number 2, verses 3 through 6, if you want to know who you are, here's one of the ways. Here's two ways you can identify. Now, by this we know that we know him. How many of you want to know that you know that you know him? By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is is not in him. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walks. What's number one? Number one, if you want to know if you know him, are you keeping his commandments? See, the, the version of Christianity that's being promoted in, on television and across the airwaves today is one of grace that you can just receive Jesus while you're sitting there. And then after you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can still sit at the computer screen watching porn and declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That is a lie from hell. That is the type of grace that is largely being promoted across the airwaves. And they may deny it and say it's not that way, but they don't take the time to explain that it's not that way, so that's what's being received by the people. That when you're in the midst of your sin, just declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and everything will be okay. That's a lie. What does it say? Let's go back to verse 3 in 1 John 2. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. They're even teaching today that the commandments are no, of no value anymore in the New Covenant and in the New Testament church. You don't even have to worry about the commandments anymore. Now understand me, folks. You don't have to keep his commandments in order to come into relationship with him. 
The reason he came and died is because we didn't have the ability to do that. And so he came and died to provide us grace and salvation. But after that, he says, I'm going to give you the power through the Holy Spirit to be able to do these things. Now, do we fail and fall short? Anybody who's failed and falls short, wave at me. That one hand that's not raised, I'm coming to see you. There is something that we do when we become followers of Jesus. In fact, the word follower is an active word. You can't follow somebody by sitting still. If you're going to follow somebody, you've got to get up and follow them. Amen? You can't follow somebody by just hearing what they have to say and say, Oh, that sounds good. I received that and not follow them. So the first thing we do is, are we keeping his commandments? Are we keeping the commandments of God? And you say, well, you know, there's a ton of commandments. You know, in the New Testament, he says, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, he said, all the other commandments are wrapped up in those two. So instead of him wanting us to do what we couldn't do with all the commandments in the Old Testament that were listed, he said, if you'll do these two, you'll be able to keep the others. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, your neighbor isn't always your brother and sister in Christ. Ray pointed back at Todd and said, I got to love Todd. He's my neighbor. Literally, he's his neighbor. But God is calling us to keep his commandments, to walk. That's what makes us followers of him because we do and are obedient to what he says. And if we can just do those two, all the others are wrapped up in it. Don't make it difficult by trying to go back and look at the over 600 and something commandments that are listed in the Old Testament law. Just take the two in the New Testament. He said, those contain all the law and the prophets are contained in those two. And the second thing he says, as a, com a completely committed follower, to walk as he walked. Jesus was never about himself when he was here. He was always about his Father. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to never, we need to never be about ourselves. We need to be about him. Is our life pointing others to him? Am I being obedient to him? Is he pleased with my life, not for my salvation, but for my discipleship and my following of him? Am I being obedient and pleasing to him? Am I truly a follower? Remember those words, humility, obedience, compassion, love, mercy, grace, and all the other godly virtues that are in the word of God. He empowers us through his Holy Spirit to be able to walk that way. I can't blame people Anybody that would want to just receive Christ as Savior and not have to worry about following Him. How can you blame anybody for that? How can you blame anybody when it's being presented that this get out of hell free card is yours and your sins are forgiven and now just go live your life? But that's why it's incumbent upon us to preach and to declare the truth of God. In our early passage of Scripture, it says when he comes, back up in Matthew, it says when he comes and when we were with him, he is going to reward us for our, not for our belief. The rewards come from our works. Pastor, you're not preaching a works-based relationship with Jesus, a salvation that's based on works. No, I am not. But I am preaching the Word of God that says, our reward in heaven that comes from him when we enter that place is based on our works and not on whether we believed or not. In fact, he challenges that whole belief principle by saying, even demons believe and tremble, but they are not followers of Jesus Christ. They are not his disciples. They are not saved because there's... Addition beyond belief of who he is is receiving who he is. We talk about that all the time. Believe, receive, become. I heard two of you say that. So it's not we're going to be rewarded for our belief. We're going to be rewarded based on how we followed him, how we were obedient to him, how we denied ourselves, how we picked up our cross, and how we followed him. School's going to be starting back this week for most of our students even the universities, I think, are starting back pretty soon as well. 
Are you going to be a follower of Christ in that environment? Or are you going to be satisfied by just being a believer because it costs you a whole lot less to be a believer than it does to be a follower? In our work environments, I believe God is challenging us this morning and through his word that are we going to be believers? Oh, yeah, people know I'm a Christian. But are you going to be a follower and deny yourself and deny your comfort and deny your popularity with those that are around you at work and deny them liking you in order to take a stand for Jesus Christ? And that stand may look, it could look all kind of different ways. It could be your opinion about a conversation that they have. And too many times we say, you know what, I just don't want to stir up the pot. I'm just not going to say anything. I believe God is calling us to say because people are lost and dying to going and going to hell because people aren't saying. Because we're not speaking up. Because we're not taking a stand. Not a political stand. A Jesus stand. A Jesus stand. Are we going to take the time to stop when God puts somebody right in the middle of our path that is hurting and we see it so clearly. Are we going to deny ourselves and our time schedule and stop to minister Christ to them? We're in the critical stages before Jesus comes back. You might say, Pastor, they've been saying that for years. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what they've been saying for years. We're alive now. And for us, we are in the critical stages before Jesus returns. And we need to be followers and not fans of Jesus. Not just fans of Jesus, but completely committed followers. The way I prayed yesterday and the way I prayed this morning is, God, don't let this just be some challenging message. Let it be something that speaks to people's hearts and begins to move them from their fandom into true followership of Jesus Christ. And if they're already followers, Lord, let them ramp that up through the power and the anointing of your spirit to be even greater followers. But it's going to cost us something to do that. And the question is, how much will it cost? And how much are we willing to pay to be completely committed followers of Christ? The inventory question today is, who are we? And the first place we look is, are we keeping his commandments? Are we being obedient to him? And the second place we look is, are we living like him? Well, I'm sure living better than some other people that say they're living like him. That's not what he called us to do. He doesn't even want us to check that out. That's not even our responsibility. He says, are you are you?" living like me and are you being obedient to me simplified by Kyle Adamman when he said are you a fan or are you a follower a completely committed follower of Christ bow your heads with me hallelujah hallelujah Spirit of God. Father, I ask, as you have used your servant to deliver this word, Holy Spirit, I ask that you make up for the places where my humanity falls short in delivering what you want to say to our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I, I pray that as you have been moving among your people this morning and challenging us and calling us, not, not getting on to us, but challenging us and calling us to a greater level of being a follower of Jesus, that you accomplish your work this morning in the lives of your people. I'm not going to have a long call to response or anything. I'll just say this. If the Lord is speaking to your heart through this message, the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about becoming a true, fully committed follower of Christ, willing to deny yourself 
to pick up your cross and to live like he lived. And you're desiring the Spirit of God to help you with that. I want you to just get up from where you are while heads are bowed and eyes closed. Come and to the front of the auditorium right here. and We're going to pray together really quickly. If that's you, I want you to come. The Lord is challenging you. No, no ministry team this morning to pray with you. I just want you to come. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. Just begin to pray and ask God what you've come up here for. Begin to ask Him. Begin to ask the Spirit of God to give you a greater strength and a greater boldness to be a completely committed follower of Christ. To ramp up that level of commitment to that place of coming to denying yourself, to picking up your cross, to being willing to pay whatever price there is to be paid and sacrifice whatever there needs to be sacrificed in order for you to be a follower of Jesus. Hallelujah. I will wait just about another 30 seconds to see if anyone else comes. Jesus. Spirit of God, do your work in us today. Move us from that comfort place into a place of commitment that goes beyond what we're able to do, that we must have your help to do. In the glorious name of Jesus. While these are praying for just a moment, I'll ask one more question. You can't even begin to come into understanding of being a follower of Christ until you've come into a relationship with Him as your Savior. That grace that we sang about this morning, that we've talked about this morning, that is free but not cheap. It cost Him His life on a cross. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I need to receive Christ. I need to come into a relationship with Him. Would you just move and come and stand right here? If there's anybody, just come and stand right here in front of me, and I want to pray with you really quickly. Anybody need to give their life to Christ today to come into a salvation experience with Him? Hallelujah. Maybe there's some students in here that God is calling to be committed followers and disciples of Him as you begin your school year. You're going to need the Holy Spirit to help you to be a fully committed, completely committed follower. Move beyond that fan base to a following relationship with Him. Would you come really quickly? Hallelujah. Brother Doug. Would you slip over to Kids Church really quickly and let them know that they can bring the kids over in just a moment? Thank you, sir. Those of you who've come forward today, this is what I'd like you to do. Look up here at me for just a second. I'd like you to kind of move all in and get kind of bunched up together right here in front of this podium, right here in the center of the church, if you would. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to just slip both of your hands up toward heaven today. This is just an act of surrender. Father, you see before you today not just people, not just their hands, but you see their hearts and their hearts cry. And Father, today in the name of Jesus, we are committing ourselves to becoming more deeply and completely committed followers of Jesus to the place of denying ourselves, our desires, our plans, our wants, of picking up our cross and being willing to suffer and being willing to have to give up things in order to be identified with you and to be called your disciple and to follow you, to live like you. Holy Spirit, we can't do that without you. So, Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you flow into each one of these in a supernatural, powerful way, God, to equip them and empower them to do exactly what their heart is crying today, to do exactly what your word speaks to us in 1 John and in Matthew chapter number 16. God, that we surrender ourselves completely to you, 
that in this day and in this hour in which we live, Father, we will be completely committed followers. We would be so radical that people will see you in us, whether we open our mouth or we live our life, they will see and know not that we're believers, but that we're followers, that we have picked up our cross and we are pursuing you. We're not just cheering what you've done, but we're pursuing who you are. We're not willing to live a life that costs us nothing, but if necessary, we'll live our life for you if it costs us everything. Hallelujah. Would everybody please stand? Jesus. the sobering moments of considering what you have spoken to us through your word this morning, God, all of us as a body of believers here at Harvest Christian Center that this house would be known first as a house of prayer because you said you would dwell in this place if it was a house of prayer. But secondly, in our community that we would be known as a place where followers of Jesus Christ gather together to worship you. Not that we'd be known as a house full of believers. We're that. Or a house full of fans. We're that too. God, we're big fans of Jesus. But beyond fans, that we would be known as a house where the followers of Jesus Christ have come together to worship you, to glorify you, to be equipped by you, to be sent out by you and to a world that is lost, to a world that is hurting, to a world that is dying because of their lack of life that comes from a relationship with your son, Jesus. God, that's our heart's desire as a corporate body, as these have come individually and renewed a commitment to be followers of Christ that are easily identified because of their obedience to you and because they walk like you walk. They live like you live. That we as a church would be known that way as well. Not for our glory, but for yours. Not for our honor, but so we can point people to you as completely committed followers of Christ. For this we give you thanks, glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, seal that desire. Don't let it be something we've just talked about once and by the time we're through lunch this afternoon, we've forgotten, but let it become a part of our fiber and our being as children of God and as followers of Jesus Christ, true disciples. Holy Spirit, equip us and seal that today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's give the Lord a good God bless you as these are returning to their seats today. Thank you, Lord. Can I tell you something? You can be seated. I believe that God loves us so much that he brings messages like this to us so we don't lose our way in the midst of all the noise, both in the church and in the world that would distract us from being his followers. And if you're thankful today to be considered to be a follower of Christ, let me hear you shout hallelujah and give the Lord a hand clap of praise in his hour. As we, as we close this morning, I'm going to ask all of our students in any level of education, college, high school, middle school, elementary school, preschool, any of our teachers, staff members at schools, any of our workers to come and stand right here across the front and face the auditorium. Pastor Al and Miss Tina are bringing our kids' church along with their helpers. And, but if you're involved in, in school in any way, in our education system in any way, staff, teachers, teachers' assistants, working anywhere in the school, or attending, ah, oh, is that Zyresha I see at home? Yeah. All right. You might need to bring some down this way or you guys slide down this way. Kai, take them, take them all the way to the speaker, buddy. Wow, isn't this a wonderful sight right here? Amen.
Tighten up in as close as you can get like you love each other. Even if you have to pretend for a minute, tighten up like you love each other. I love the way teenage boys that are not going to get within a foot of each other. Inside a foot is invading space. Look, we got them coming around the, around the bend here. Now, I want to say something before we pray. We are blessed at Harvest Christian Center to have all these students and children in our church. If you believe that, would you give the Lord another praise? Look at this. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, I love it when we see them in this environment like this where we can see them all at one time. And this is by no means all of them, but it's just all that are here today. Amen. We have brand new teachers starting teacher career down here on the end. I saw that big deep breath she took when I said that. We have seasoned staff people. We have young people in college, kids that are starting school, maybe starting the next level of school moving from middle school to high school, elementary to middle school, people going into the graduate program. We want to pray God's blessings, strength, and protection over them. And we want to pray for all the faculty and staff that will touch their lives this year that aren't in this room, that these would find favor with them, that God would speak to those who are not believers in Him and bring them to a place of coming to know them, maybe through watching some of the way you live. I don't want you to hurt your necks, but turn around and look up here at me for just a second, all of you. That now, I know Kids Church wasn't in here for this message, but I know they heard a message this morning. But I want you to know that you're representatives of Jesus Christ in your schools this year. That's the most important thing, but you're also representatives of this house in the things that you do. But the most important thing is that you represent Jesus and you represent him well. We're going to pray for your protection and safety, but we want you to be good examples for your teachers and for your other classmates. We want you to excel every way you can academically and every way that God is going to teach you through teachers and staff people this year. And I hope it stays on your mind all the time. I'm telling you, if there's a campus that needs Jesus, it's the University of Florida. Zyresh is our seed planted in the University of Florida. They need Jesus almost as bad as Tuscaloosa needs Jesus. Let's pray. I'm going to ask any of our pastoral staff, our elders, and our deacons, and your spouses, if you would come and just stand across the front of these. And you, you're not going to be able to touch every one of them. There's not enough of us to do that. But get in front of a group and just spread your hands out in front of them. And I want all of you to stretch your hands up this way and, and not just listen to me pray over them, but you pray over them. And make sure we've got every section covered if we need somebody to stretch out a little bit hallelujah father in the name of jesus god we thank you for heritage we thank you for inheritance we thank you lord for our now and our before and we thank you for our future and god represented here are all three of those things the before because they've had things sown into them by their parents and by teachers and by pastors and by youth leaders, by kids' church workers, by nursery workers. They are present because they have the ability to lead and influence right now where they are, at the age they are, in the schools that they will be in. And they are our future, Lord, because as you continue to develop them, they are going to become our next leaders in business, in community, and in the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we pray your hand of protection to be upon them, that no harm will come to them physically, emotionally, or even educationally during this school year. Protect them, Lord. Give them safety over their minds, 
their bodies and their spirits. And then, God, we pray that you'd anoint them and stir them to be representatives, to be followers of Jesus Christ, to represent you in their schools by the way they live and the way they talk and the way they turn in their homework and all the things, God, that will cause them to be a good influence for the kingdom in their schools. We pray that you'd bless their families, Lord, in this year, that the provision of heaven would be upon them, and they'd not lack anything, but they'd have all that they have need of. We pray for the peace of heaven to be upon them. We pray, God, for the teachers and faculty and staff that are represented in our church, and they stand in today representing the entire teaching community and the entire staff community in these schools that touch the lives of our kids. God, we pray that you would give our kids favor, your kids favor, God, in the schools. Bless our teachers and staff people, Lord, as they pour themselves out into young lives and as they impact them in powerful ways. And God, let this be the first of continued prayer this school year for our students and children at Harvest Christian Center that you have blessed us with. And we give you thanks for all of that and for all of them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen. Give them a good God bless you as they make their way. Pastor Fred's coming to speak and pray a blessing over us this morning. God bless you, sir. Don't forget prayer tonight at 6 p.m. Join me in prayer. Let's stand together. somebody beside you as we pray, okay? Thank you, Lord, that we can come together. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you're making us not like a bunch of different nuts and bolts in a box, but you're putting together a strong machine. You're assembling something. You have done that in Christ Jesus, and we're connected to you. You're our power source. Lord, would you give your strength, your protection, your power as we go out of here today and let us speak, speak the love of God, show the love of God, speak the name of Jesus, lift him up wherever we go. We pray it in your mighty name. Everybody say amen. God bless you today. Bless you.